Hello, and welcome to another episode of Music, Philosophy, and More. I'm your host, John Henry Sheridan, and today I have a friend of mine, a fellow singer-songwriter from Salt Lake City, Utah, Ben Brinton. Hey, hey, John. How, uh, uh, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to, uh, to sit down and have this chat with you, man. Yeah, man, it's cool. I remember you... Uh, Sometimes I like to uh, start off a podcast and just discuss how we how we met. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, I remember you and I uh, first met at uh, Cheer Up Charlie's, if I'm right. You had just landed and and we were watching some live group uh, performer and you came over and just struck up a conversation, really friendly, casual guy. And I was like, yeah, cool. Someone who's willing to just talk and, and talk about the conference and it, just, it felt like an old friend that I've known for years, you know, and then we hung out a few times after. And uh, what was your memory of that? Yeah, you know, I, I definitely remember the Cheer Up Charlie's and um, the, coming in that night, there was they had classes dur during the day that I was sad I missed out on. So mm -hmm. I was really kind of going there with this like, oh, I want to know what I missed out. And then uh, but it kind of, you know, it's a big room full of strangers. And I think I was just sort of like, okay, let's start here. And it was you. So it's like, uh, and then uh, you're right. Yeah. The conversation kept uh, uh, getting better and better. And, and uh, I think, I think it was the first time I had kind of a, a group group strategy uh, going into these classes and, and kind of dividing up what the interests are and, and mm -hmm. sharing thoughts and notes afterwards. So, you know, it's, it's always been real positive and, and constructive. So. I'm, I'm sorry we couldn't meet together this year, but it's good to, it's really good to be in touch still. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I was definitely looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. um, and last year too, last year was canceled, right? Um, mm -hmm. So it was 2019 that we saw each other, but yeah. Uh, yeah, it reminded me actually pretty much once I met you and, uh, and we had that other guy that we were hanging out with, uh, <laughs> Danny, uh, I think his name, maybe. Uh, yeah, there was a handful of people that we kind of yeah, uh, in, yeah. intermingled with. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, anyway, I mean, it felt like I was back in college because I went to music school and mm -hmm. um, just reminded me of that vibe. But even cooler in a way, because this was more of what I wanted to learn instead of, you know, just the, yeah. what was being taught. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that was fun. Um, so, yeah, let's uh, dive right into it. Um, so thank you, anybody who's watching live. Got a couple of live listeners. Feel free to drop in a question at any time. Uh, for Ben or myself or a comment and uh, don't forget to hit the love button and share it if you'd like um, so we can uh, share our good vibes all right so Ben yeah can you remember what it was that first got you into enjoying music in the first place um, you know I, I, I was fortunate enough to have uh, music kind of in in my household uh, both my parents were playing the guitar as a, as a hobby and my mom was um, uh, was a French teacher, and she used uh, French folk songs as part of like teaching kids and stuff. And um, so uh, I remember just having that being a part of of uh, I don't know. It, the instruments were always around, and they were always entertaining, um, something to 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 have. But I think uh, I found myself really wanting or really being fascinated by the songwriting process. Uh, in, in, in middle school, um, having, having a tune that was just sort of stuck in my head that um, while it was in my head could kind of go anywhere. I could sing anything. I could, you know, that really free, uh, free form. And then, uh, and then as I was, you know, going through high school and stuff, I really started to apply it to a guitar um, and, uh, uh, and put what was in my head out somehow. And so, but yeah, I think, you know, I, I, I've always had music around, but around middle school is when I really was intrigued by bands and artists and songs in particular. Uh, the storytelling of certain songs I was really quite impressed with. Um, I think, um, yeah, if I were just kind of like lists like artists that inspired me, like uh, Depeche Mode is one of those uh, groups that had just always been kind of on my radar. And when I at that age, I guess they were kind of broadening my horizons to uh, the, the vast amount of um, emotions that the songs and stories can convey. But they're just one of several kind of artists that um, that um, I just was really intrigued by. I was like, "Wow, that's cool!" Like, yeah, I don't know, it's like in a way, in a way, a little jealous. I think that and, uh, being like, "Wow, I I I, I want to do that." You know? mm -hmm. 
Right, right. So, so you both parents were into music. Mm -hmm. uh, did you absorb their musical taste too? You know, I don't think I absorbed their musical taste, although now I'm appreciating it more. Um, they were um, kind of that Peter, Paul and Mary uh, folk Americana. Um, but uh, it, uh, it wasn't like we went and saw these people live, um, you know, and, and at, you know, it, we didn't have Netflix or documentaries and, and YouTube at the time to kind of deep dive into these artists. Um, mm -hmm. But nowadays, and now I do sort of reflect back and um, appreciate that uh, the, the, the songs that, that uh, I would associate them with, uh, Peter, Paul and Mary, for example, they, they, uh, they have a lot of uh, success with kind of like kids shows, you know, this uh, smaller crowd, but uh, they're fun, really approachable songs that mm -hmm. can be funny or they, um, uh, uh, as well as just uh, audience interactive. I think that was part of it. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, looking, looking back at the, uh, their tastes, I, I'm, I'm appreciating it more. Um, my dad and I, we definitely relate on, you know, kind of Johnny Cash and, Creedence Clearwater, those, those classic rock ones. But there's, there's always, there's always this, this conversation of like, hey, do you know this song? And he'll noodle around on it, and I'll be like, nope. <laughs> so, and, uh, but that's 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 part of the exchange, you know, understanding mm -hmm. what, what songs he's into. Wow. You have do you have a clear memory when music like started, in your life, or is it always? For me, it feels like it's always kind of been there, but maybe it's different. Uh. My clearest memory, if as if like a starting point, um, might have been like Michael Jackson. Uh, was it uh, probably the Thriller album or like mm -hmm. uh, one of his? I mean, probably Beat It. I think that came out in '83 or something mm -hmm. like that. And hearing my one of my cousins brought the cassette tape over, maybe around '84. So I was yeah. probably three years old. And uh, yeah, hearing that, I thought that was super cool. Yeah. And fast forward a couple of years, maybe I was in first grade and then there was always Irish music playing in my house. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> I would Clancy Brothers, things like that, um, Wolf Tones, and I would sing along. I would learn the lyrics because it was on repeat and I would sing along, act it out, be real goofy. So it was funny. So when heavy metal came into my life in second or third grade, I was resistant. Like, oh, I don't, I don't like these guys with the long hair. And I told my friends, I like opera, not this. Of course, I didn't like opera, but I just wanted to be different. You know, I felt yeah. pressure. Okay. Yeah, I guess that would be my uh, yeah. like very beginnings of music and hearing Billy Joel, Cindy Lauper, things like that. Yeah. yeah. Are you are you um, are you kind of uh, do you see your taste being pretty consistent throughout your life, or do you find yourself, uh, for example, you know, what are you into now versus kind of what you what got you to keep going with music? Yeah, pretty consistent. Um, because whatever basically it's this thing I've noticed if I if I didn't like it in 1991 or 95 mm -hmm. and unless I try to like it now I probably still won't yeah um of course there's a lot of new stuff that I'll discover but I'm like oh let me try that band again I put on like no I just I don't like it you know yeah, <laughs> yeah. but of course it, it evolves and uh, there are some music of my child my youth let's say my teenage years that it's just too aggressive too heavy uh, you know not net basically negative so very sparingly i'll listen yeah, to I, it, I, I kind of feel like if i didn't know you i would have assumed you would have some sort of metal music taste but i guess that's mm -hmm. not the case oh no no i know it is very much it so. is oh, yeah. okay okay so you when mean, like, it's still today you mean I, yeah i guess yeah well no i guess it just sounds like the, the metal was something when did you start to like the heavier uh metal stuff i guess yeah, I, I like I, Guns N' Roses and Metallica came into my life around 89 or when Appetite for Destruction came. So I was eight years old, you know, yeah. and then yeah. by 11, I like really wanted a guitar. Yeah, no, or 10. Uh, so at the late age of 11, I got a guitar. Yeah. And so, yeah, so from 11, I was pretty much a, a metalhead. And <laughs> through my team, you know, on my YouTube, I've been putting out recently um, archive stuff. So like my yeah. metal band from my teenage years, you hear me screaming, playing very heavy loud stuff. <laughs> okay. So I still listen to Iron Maiden and a bit Halloween, a lot of bands on a regular basis. It is kind of my preferred music, but more like soft rock would be more common because I live with my wife and son. So something that's not going to rock the boat too much, but definitely sure. rock metal.
sure with with discretion nowadays you know yeah yeah yeah. Um, I mean, you would, re- I think you'd really appreciate the Salt Lake metal scene. There's, um, in terms of live music around here, there's, um, not too many, I guess you have your arts festivals and you have those sort of things, but the sort of key music festivals, and may- maybe I'm just not aware of them, but I've only been able to find the metal fests. So I've been to a mm-hmm. handful of kind of metal, metal local bands that I've been pretty impressed with, you know, proud, proud to say they're from Utah. Glad I got to see them live, but, um, oh, cool. but yeah. yeah you know if, if you have any recommendations i will ask for recommendations later feel free to let sure. me know i'm going to put in the show notes for people to check out yeah 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 just want to say hello to our friend uh joao de jesus uh he's a friend from brazil hola joao hola joao obrigado so when i was uh i was living there for about a half a year as a volunteer humanitarian volunteer and um he, he was one of the guys who helped us out he I think he helped me get an opportunity to play perform it in, in front of the school. It was like 2010 and yeah. in front of children. So he's in the culture department, uh, yeah. uh, educational culture department there. Yeah. And he speaks pretty good English, which is very rare okay. for people in the in this sort of rural part of Brazil to speak English. So. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. So thanks, guys. Uh, keep keep uh, comments coming, and uh, thanks for watching once again, whether it's on the replay or live. So next question, Ben. And Ben's uh, tossing questions right back at me. So watch out, guys. You're going to learn yeah, about me. Yeah, this is going to be a good. <laughs> we're going to cover all sorts of bases here. Because we got time. We have to catch up. We're gonna, yeah, there's, there's some time. But uh, shoot with your next question. All right. So how would you describe the overall influence music has had on your life up until today? It's a broad question, but. Ooh. Um, you know, there's um i think of some pretty key moments in my life where it was always sort of like what what degree do you want to get into you know what kind of what school do you want to go to what programs do you want to go into what kind of um uh, uh i guess institutions uh where um i decided to go into theater more but then eventually it was kind of a more of a musical theater so um music has always sort of been there um, and it was always, it was always something I felt like had, uh, uh, I guess a, an intelligence for, you know, I, I, I could, I could carry a pitch well enough that people would need, would, could use me in their choir, um, or where I, I, I was an instrumental with the guitar. So it ten, because I had that guitar ability, I could play a pirate for a kid's show and get a job that way kind of thing. So, um, um, the it sort of had this under underlining influence in everything I was doing, um, and a lot of it was sort of um, if I can do this and play music, if I can get a job with music, if I can, um, it always always appealed to me, and uh, I think I it probably steered me away from being a computer programmer or something else that's a little more lucrative um, right. <laughs> but at the end of the day i've always i've always uh, valued um uh, valued experiences and i think I, I i i've always had a guitar to kind of go home to and ponder with um, i always had a song idea or an emotion i was trying to capture and musically was the best way in which i could capture it or at least capture it for my own sanity for my own sake so yeah that influence is pretty under uh it always in the background um that uh more often than not led me into opportunities that uh, i wouldn't if they, if i didn't have music is that um just joy joy in my life yeah i had this feeling when i was a teenager for sure like what the heck do people do if they're not into music I just couldn't fathom it. Like, how do you survive? Yeah. Especially at that raw age, you know? Well, I'm, cause to me, there's this, uh, instinct. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's instinctual thing. Um, there's there it's, it's cultural. So it's also this thing that connects people. It's like the whole way the village is going to survive is by having this common thread that typically is communicated through music. Um, mm-hmm. um, African drum beats or, you know, Irish folk tales, that um that uh so yeah without it i i i I think it would i I don't think you'd have a strong society you wouldn't you wouldn't have a culture that um 
that uh, cared about itself or enjoyed itself because it wouldn't have that aspect to it. Yeah, it's definitely mm. really profound stuff, music. Yeah. Um, yeah. So would you say, uh, so then leading to today, seems to me, to something from wrong, that as you, as you got older, music kind of became more and more uh, sort of serious in your life. Is that fair? Yeah, I think uh, um, there, there, there was always that ambition to be successful with it. But I think the definition of successful uh, changed. Um, and uh, uh, also kind of understanding that, you know, the... <laughs> Uh, the, the rock bands that I could be a part of in my youth that I had the energy for, um, I don't really have now. And so um, uh, that, that measurement of success is quite a bit different. Uh, and uh, that seriousness, though, I, I think the seriously, though, is always about trying to get better. I think it was uh, seriously always trying to find um, something else that audiences enjoyed or uh, another topic that uh, or you know, song that... Um, felt unique and honest and genuine. Mm -hmm. um, but nowadays it's not so much about performing it as it is like, I think recording it and producing it, distributing it. I mean, that, that measurement of success, especially when we, you know, maybe when we, when we start talking about DIY festival, like now there's like a number, there's like an algorithmic kind of measurement that I can say, well, is this more successful? Is this more, does this make me a more serious uh, mu musician or artist in that regard? Um, whereas before I think I was, you know, I was seriously about trying to win the battle of the bands or serious about trying to get a gig. Um, mm -hmm. so, um, but, uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's not a full-time thing for me. I, I work other jobs. I, I kind of work hard, play hard and doing music is part of that play. Mm -hmm. I think I'm finally at that point though. And in, 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 uh, finding people and people find me that, um, they want to support the arts and they, I think I, uh, um, you know, you really want to, I want to have a quality product that's worth money. So um, that's part of that seriousness. Because mm -hmm. as soon as, as soon as money's on the table, then it does change things. That, that concept of seriousness becomes um, people's expectations. Um, it becomes more, more high pressure. Um, yeah. So, mm -hmm. but, but, uh, but uh, it's, it's kind of interesting that you use the word serious because um, I mean, uh, do you take your music pretty seriously when people kind of describe what you're into? Is it, he's a serious musician? And like, uh, I'm definitely a goofy musician. If you ever seen my videos, yeah. no, I love you. The march, <laughs> the march of the marshmallows is one of my yeah. favorites. So. <laughs> um, but serious in, in the sense that it's gonna, I'm gonna prioritize it. It's gonna go on my calendar book, and I'm gonna make every effort. If I choose that this is, a, I have a vision for something, I'm gonna be serious about seeing it to completion most of the time, even if it takes me years, you know, there are some things I'll be releasing. I have been releasing, I recorded in 2007. I'm all about just, even 2001, I, I, I did a, an album recently, I record, recorded and I released it recently. Okay. Just because uh, for me, it's all this big process. So in terms of serious, I don't mean, for me, when I say serious, I might imply the whole, uh, uh, make money aspect of being a business, but mm -hmm. I don't, I don't personally mean that. Um, um, I, for me, it's more uh, from the perspective of an artist, you know, so I look at someone like Pete Seeger or uh, Bob Dylan, even though those are very successful guys, mm -hmm. but just someone who's like consistently putting out art because they have to, you know, so in the sense I'm serious about leaving a legacy. Uh, and for me too, it's definitely not a full-time thing in terms of what I get paid to, how I get paid to survive. But yeah. uh, I'm serious that I got to put it out. It's kind of like, otherwise I'll be constipated and die. I, you know, it's like, yeah. I got to poop. It's the same thing for an artist, you know, I think on some level. Yeah. Now there's that, that, that process where the idea hits you and you're, you're going to, you just can't enjoy your life when that idea is festering. So uh, <laughs> being able to capture it and put it somewhere to the point where, to the extent where you can be like, okay, it's out of my head. So I, I can, I can go back to, um, you know, living. Um, so I, I think I, I know I can really think, I know what you mean by that, that constipation feeling. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. And, I, and I think when we honor it, 
you know, we're, we're honoring it because uh, we kind of suspect that it, it's, it's not really here for us. We're just a, a medium through which this comes, you know, and that when, of course, it's where we can enjoy it too, but uh, it's like the universe is trying to speak through us. And if we allow that to speak, we can, you know, enrich it with this music that only, only we can create, you know, or whatever yeah. it is that we create, you know. Yeah, you got me thinking about going back to that kind of serious concept, um, and uh, and uh, the 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 most uh, influential advice I got was from a, a visual artist that's in uh, in Salt Lake and um, an older woman that really looked me in the eyes and said, you know, whatever you're doing, make sure you like it, make sure it's your thing that you you are being genuine and authentic in terms of its creation, and. Uh, I do kind of feel like uh, that changed a lot of the way I looked when before I was uh, maybe not taking it as seriously about my own expression as serious about my own authenticity. Uh, but I was, you know, trying to fit the, uh, the uh, perceived expectations or fit the, 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 the caliber that I assumed people wanted and <laughs> really had my own personal um, opinion was sort of the second opinion where I do feel like that's shifted a little bit more nowadays. I'm kind of like, if I'm not feeling excited about this, then, then I think that's a sign uh, that's mm -hmm. not being authentic. That's not being serious in, in a different way. So, right, right. yeah. Yeah. I, I could tell you, yeah. So I guess it's a good spot as any to at least first mention that uh, Ben, you have a new album out. So I love the, the title. Am I, is it pocket octaves or pocket octaves? Pocket, pocket octaves. So okay. uh, playing playing off of the whole musical phrase octaves, um, mm -hmm. and then I use a Z um, as as uh, there's some electronic kind of aspects to the CD that um, um, I think is that's the visual sort of it's not it's not what you expect it's it's a little off it's not correct spelling of things, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but yeah and then uh, the, it's it's actually I think my eight my eighth album so um, that I've kind of put in my independent career. Uh, and so uh, uh, octaves being eight notes, it, I was playing off of this theme of the powerful number of eight. And so that was sort mm. of the, 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 the phrase that I'm like, ooh, I kind of like that pocket octaves. So. Mm -hmm. It's cool. And I was saying pocket octaves for a while to myself okay. because it looked, the, the design has this uh, Spanish feel to me. Yeah. You know? And then octaves, I don't know, I didn't know what that was, but I just didn't. Then I, I think uh, maybe in your email, you spelt it or accidentally spelt it with an S. Yeah. I read a pocket octaves. I'm like, oh, is that what it's called? Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I think the mistake of pocket octaves is pretty cool too. But both are super cool uh, pocket octaves. It's a yeah. cool, it just gets you thinking like, what the heck does that mean? But it sounds like it means something, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, that this whole album had um, um, a lot of, I guess, Easter egg kind of concepts to it. Um, you know the uh, the album artwork is, is is sort of a scene that you would uh, a land a mountainscape you would see kind of out of Salt Lake, uh, mm -hmm. the pocket octaves, the power of eight, uh, it's, uh, and then you also have twelve songs, which is the, in a chromatic scale an octave of itself, and then there's this you know it's the same artist but I'm doing quite a bit different two different things two different uh, areas with my music so. Um, it's re and then I'm kind of you know you, you do something I do something like that and there's the aspect of like I don't know maybe who knows how any of this is going to be interpreted, but uh, mm -hmm. it was sort of uh, that's what I like that's my 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 choice we'll see we'll see what happens. Uh, well, I, but I, I, I appreciate the feedback you know. Yeah, I played it for my my wife today and my son because I was excited about it. I'm like you guys have to hear. I know what they would kind of gravitate towards. They they love things yeah. with melody. Yes, you know, and that's in a solid. Uh, something you could grasp you know like oh this is a song and i i get mm -hmm. it and it's going somewhere it's taking me on a journey and there's a nice melody and good rhythm very yeah. cleanly recorded very crisp yep. um i sent it to uh my friend jason hills who was the uh, producer of my first two albums because it reminded me of when him and i did these first two albums it was the very acoustic bare bones thing but yeah. you sound i mean and it's fleshed out in areas too but yeah. uh you sound like you're having a lot of fun and that uh, really came across this time. Cool, thank you. Yeah, the, there's there's a a, a, the, a lot of the acoustic stuff was with the help of a friend um, who helped mix it and played some bass on it. Um, and then uh, the the other parts of it were just kind of me in my in my 
my room kind of doing it all myself. Um, so there uh, is this big wash of, of sonic values that I, I, you know, playing around with the idea that it is, it doesn't have to fit one specific thing right now. So I'm just going to try it all and kind of see what, what people are gravitated to, what songs uh, mm -hmm. people appreciate. And if it's the more acoustic stuff or if it's the more electronica stuff, then it's, it's fun to see, just see mm -hmm. how, what happens. Yeah. And take, take some and throw it on the wall, right. And see what sticks. Yeah. The type of Big thing. time. Yeah, which is why I was—I felt pretty proud of myself when watching the DIY conference and, and the, this kind of repeating theme of like, oh man, it's just experimenting. You just gotta like, here's your here's your things and try it, and then go from there. And that's really all anyone can do. <laughs> right. If you want to like wake up and be happy, you know, you gotta just follow your heart. Yeah. And yeah. enjoy it. Yeah. Enjoy. It's all the process at the end of the day, right? It's the journey. Yeah. It's the um, journey. And you're better for it. You know, I'm excited. I mean, I'm exhausted after it, but I'm excited because, you know, I, I do have a different springboard to jump from with the next song ideas and the next album that wants to be put together. Um, um, I didn't yeah. realize you released something so new. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I'm pretty uh, poor at uh, um, promoting stuff these days. And I, I always been kind of, you know, that, that's not my um, strong point, but I, yeah. I've done so much of it in my life. And at some point I have to ask, where does it get me? So mm -hmm. at this point, I just put things out, you know, with that little expectation yeah. and again, see where it lands. And then sometimes things land, you know, yeah. um, <clears throat> this one song I put out, actually, uh, Joao de, de Jesus knows it. I put it out, a song called Batendo na Porta do Seu, which is the Brazilian version of knocking on heaven's door okay and I, I learned it when i was in brazil i learned the words and uh i always used to play knock on heaven's door anyway and then i did it i just recorded it kind of on a whim one night uh back in 2016 and i released it with the license and everything and uh wow. it's it's been like my my biggest song on spotify it's um it's played in brazil regularly you know it's it's yeah. over a thousand listens which isn't a lot but nothing else is in my catalog so who knew that that was gonna really land and i have a few more brazilian songs planned but i'm not yeah. uh, not there yet okay all right so brazil's kind of your market then you got a lot you got a lot of interest and buzz in brazil yeah i mean i can see if i get those other two out. I'm, I'm not going to promote it but yeah. if people look up these other two songs i have in mind that are kind of popular mm -hmm. and there's not too many other covers there well if they're all at least it's probably no other covers of an American guy. Okay. So, you know, maybe they'll be interested to hear it. Yeah. Uh, so we got one question for you um, from Joao. And he says, uh, how, how do you think about people who set music in people's lives during this pandemic to make their lives more happier? Singers, for example. So I guess, you know, uh, how do you think the role, what's the role music's been playing in this pandemic? Yeah, um, um, you know, it's, uh, uh, I, I guess what I'll preface is, is my kind of music when I'm, when I'm performing actually on audiences, it tends to be in a smaller crowds. It's uh, more of an intimate kind of thing. Uh, the, uh, the, the impact though, and I think kind of the service it's provided is uh, that idea, especially when the pandemic hit and there was just all this idea of like, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't, we like, we've never, we've never done this before. Um, you know, there's, that's when certain songs start to have just a much more profound meaning. Um, and uh, uh, even covers, even my originals, I had to kind of look at them differently because they were coming from this place of my own insecurity, my own worry, my own panic. Um, and uh, and uh, I think that's that's where you, I saw a real interest in people being like um, they they liked they liked that sort of moment um, uh, of, uh, of I, taking their mind off of things, but at the same time still sort of acknowledge I don't know recognizing that the song is maybe more emotional or more powerful because it's it's. Um, it's another human being going through the same thing. And this is part of that expression of it. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I like guess one of the songs that comes to mind, uh, there's a Radiohead song, Fake Plastic Trees. 
Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I did a, I, I, I tried to do some Facebook live stuff, um, uh, but I wasn't very good at it because I, I kind of, I, I don't, in, I don't know, I don't have the enthusiasm for social media uh, and the process of doing it. And then there's also, you just, you don't even know how it's going to be. It's live. It, it, the quality is maybe not going to be there, whatever. Um, but that was definitely one of those songs that people reached out to. And, and it was, it was, a, it was um, powerful enough for them to be like, I'm so glad you're singing. So glad you're alive. So glad you're sharing music and, and uh, bringing an element of calm uh, mm -hmm. at the same time, taking my mind off of it or, or, or having me focus on something else. So. Cool. Yeah. Good answer. I, uh, if you see my eyes drifting, it's I have another screen with the screen yeah. with the feed there. And um, totally. so uh, my friend Constantine Mediuk says, I love uh, fake plastic trees. I do too. That's one of the few radio yeah. songs I really like. No, it's um, it's one of those songs that lyrically speaking is so so profound um, and can be accessible because of that, but um, mm -hmm. also very uh, unique and and meaning meaningful to my understanding of the world that I live in. So, yeah, it's a, it's an excellent song that um, I wish I could always do justice. I, I still just enjoy playing it though, you know, whether or not mm -hmm. I do it justice. So, yeah, yeah it's cool. also one of those songs that can be done. Uh, on acoustic guitar with voice from mm -hmm. Radiohead. Not all mm -hmm. of them can be, you know, effectively, yeah. I think. Oh, and I think kind of mm -hmm. going on that a little more of a tangent there, um, this uh, this moment of crisis in the pandemic, um, I think it helped me really appreciate uh, the value of the, the minimalism, the simplicity of something, mm -hmm. um, you know, because now you don't have the crowd and you don't have the stage and you don't have the PA. And, and with all that, you don't have those problems. Um, and you have uh, instead this smaller, more intimate one-on-one -on -one that um, it certainly fits more of the the, the vibe that um, I produce when I perform. It's 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 more of a campfire setting. It's it's the mm -hmm. idea that the village is gathering around together, um, uh, yeah. and music might be the focal point of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I I got Great that question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, um, thank him. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Arigato, uh, obrigado. Um, so, uh, I had, I had something there that I was going to go off of, uh, oh yeah. So, um, you know, when the pandemic was underway for a few months, a good friend of mine, Tom Scuderi, who's kind of like my, my, uh, my one man street team. He's always like promoting my stuff. Uh, I didn't even hire him. He just took the job, you know? Okay. Uh, yeah. I got one of those. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In invaluable. He's like my Sam Gamgee. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. He, he basically said, um, John, you really, you know, you should start doing your Facebook lives because uh, everyone, everyone's sitting at home. Everyone's kind of depressed. This was his perspective. And, uh, you know, when, when someone goes Facebook live, it's like something's happening now. There's this human connection that lifts you up yeah. for a little while. And this was like in the first few months of it. So I, I was hesitant to do Facebook live for, I experimented a lot with it over the years, but yeah, I didn't love it. And I didn't have a great sound on it. So, and then he, I just started thinking, well, it would be good to, then I could just play for a block of time and then do all my songs and uh, just kind of like polish my own playing, uh, interact with people. And it just happened to be that that was a good time to do it. And I did this regular weekly schedule, did yeah. 10 episodes of, for, for 10 weeks, played lots of music. And I started, I got, uh, you know, um, donations. I set up a tip jar. Yeah. And then, uh, then I tried it again later on in the year, and it just very few watches, partially because people started returning to work. I was doing a different time. I wasn't as into it. But uh, actually, this um, uh, podcast really came out of it, too, because my friend Tom was like, and then yeah, you could bring your friends on and talk to them. And, and I was like, and he was listing friends, other musicians that he knew. And mm -hmm. it's like, okay. And I tried it, and it just it was not working at all if there was no like easy way to do that with Facebook live. And then I, so I enlisted my other friend and I tried to do this thing, OBS of uh, open broadcast software. Okay. And uh, which is free, uh, by the way, if you want to broadcast, yeah, but you have to have down. Yeah. OBS. Um, and, uh, but you need a fairly powerful machine for it, but you could broadcast the multiple things you could do broadcast to YouTube, Facebook and Twitch at the same time. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
which is would be really cool if you have uh, presence on all those. So, but for me, my computer couldn't handle it. So my friend was a different friend. Lou was hosting me on his powerful machine. He was my co-host, and then I was I started the podcast like that. Yeah, and then uh, eventually I, re- I learned that um, I didn't want to a- ask him for a favor every time. I learned that Zoom Pro account was able to do uh, like I could just talk to people on Zoom and stream it to Facebook. You can only do one Facebook or YouTube at a time, but I see. Anyway, but I'm just kind of riffing on the pandemic thing and how it evolved my own yeah. uh, interaction with people. Yeah. Um, and it makes me want want to ask you this question. I think part of my hesitancy in, in broadcasting more often or being, I was, I was hesitant to, to be as, as much on it as possible was the idea that this whole like Facebook live thing was also like being, you know, this, this thing is happening right now. And it's not just me and my apartment, but it's like, you know, the black lives riots sort of walks that are happening, you know, or the, the, uh, there, we had a big, you know, windstorm and trees are getting you know there's there's these other like more important um <laughs> facebook live things going on and it kind of felt like oh here listen to me and my guitar was a bit silly um when when there seemed to be so many other things that might be just more important um i wonder what do you think about that when an artist that's 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 doing what they do but um under un, under these circumstances where everything is in in the world it could it might just feel, I don't know, more important than music, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I see where you're coming from. And I, I think uh, I always face, I think probably many of us face that insecurity of like, um, I, I don't know if I think about it as more important, but I think about it as like, um, I'm definitely not a, uh, a top tier priority for survival, for my songs, right? I mean, breathing and so air and water, <laughs> water and, and shelter, know, shelter. Sure. And, those are things you might want to start first before and your kids right yeah. and stuff like yeah. that and, yeah. and maybe uh but for a lot of people that translates to work right mm-hmm. so all those things like so i understand if they're working or you're dealing with your family or something and i'm saying hey look at me you know i'm not a priority right. but at yeah. the same time if well the way i look at it so part of the reason i, I did this podcast with like confidence was that I, my vow is like, I want to be an alternative to uh, a lot of the, the fear mongering or just the negativity in the media. So to just have something available for people to tune into that is going to be uplifting or at the very least neutral, you know, mm-hmm. and just not like rile them up in any way. And just like, Oh, wow. I feel like I'm just hanging out with two friends. They're not challenging me. We're like, we're not saying like, yeah, and we got this many subscribers because we did this. You should be like us. We're just talking. Right. And that might come up, but it's not the purpose of it. You know, it's not to like yeah. challenge people to uh, whatever up their game. You know, it's just two people talking, you know, which I think people miss just sitting yeah. around hanging out. Well, you I like know? that. You, you give them the option, you know, there's this, if it's one thing, if that's all that they have at their disposal, well, disposal is just all the challenges and, and, and whatnot. But if there's, this other thing that they can consciously sort of choose between. Uh, um, yeah, no, I like that. Yeah, and I would think the same for a show like yours. But again, if, if you actually don't like doing it, then, it, then that would translate too, you know? But if you yeah. say, you know, this is gonna be my opportunity, I'm gonna practice all my songs, and then I'm gonna make it a, and a chance to hang out with a few people who show up or to practice promoting right. or whatever, or just do a launch for my album. If there was something that made you confident that i'm going to do this for ben no matter what Mm. then people would receive that energy like okay well he's going to be there so that's cool it's uh tuesday at four i'm going to tune in because uh, tuesday at four i know ben's going to be there otherwise i'll check him out later yeah you know and the handful of people it might be a lot might be a handful uh Mm. can grab onto that i've always believed in like building a very small cell which it sounds like you do too with the campfire idea yeah. you know, small groups of people. And then just, you know, I used to hang out in my basement with a lot of friends and then this like social network evolved from that, but it was just yeah. three people here, five people there, two yeah. people, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I like that. And, and then, and then people, especially you have a good vibe. If you throw your jokes in, you know, and uh, I'm not mm-hmm. saying you should do it or anything, but you know, if you <laughs> wanted to, 
Yeah, no, no, no shoulds, right? You know, but no um, shoulds, yeah, I'll do what I want. I'm at that point now. <laughs> yeah, no, but but I'm saying uh, I could certainly imagine if your show was up and you had this like consistent, happy energy, uh, you're would joking, you your good songs, and then people get used to the songs that you're you're hanging. They feel like they're hanging out with you, and people do it successfully. But I guess to some extent, it's got to match your personality or something that 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 consistency would be sort of the catch that i'm kind of like oh that and that's where that's where the music starts to feel more like work and then and then consistently being able to log on and post and share and distribute um means i feel i feel like i'm becoming more and more uh a slave of the social media thing like i become less and less about uh, writing and and producing and stuff and it's more about pandering and posting and and or maybe that's more fear but um yeah i think i, I struggle with that because uh, i i don't i don't like the idea that so much of whatever success um may be it requires this consistent involvement with social media yeah i'm right there with you man yeah. uh yeah i so when I, re I i did this uh so I did a pretty good run of these live shows, Facebook lives in 2020. Then I tried to do it again, 2021. I did called mini concerts because I was doing 12 songs. That was too much. So I mm -hmm. made like four or six songs. Mm -hmm. I did four of them. I was like, screw this, man. I just, I was <laughs> like, not. Uh, no. Yeah, it's, it takes energy. It takes discipline. And, and yeah. I, I felt like, a, how can I say this in a nice way? I felt like, definitely don't want to use to go extreme use the word like prostitute or something but i felt like i was selling my soul really for, yeah. for what you know for what you know i was yeah. trying to fit a mold that that you know yeah I, I i kind of uh feel like that's the the conundrum that we are in as artists in our modern day and age um it's it's that your success requires some level of sacrifice or there's this this uh you won't be successful unless you have some level of sacrifice um and that's just that's just kind of part of the the beast that we are in the, the entertainment industry or the music industry or, or whatnot um uh so it's um yeah well well i would not to cut you off uh but i would say that success by you know their definition or by mm -hmm. an external definition because we could redefine success you know yeah yeah yeah. like you doing your recording in your room if you're happy when you're doing it why isn't that successful you know uh, that's a good point yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah and you know just the fact that you could wake up and want to do it again you know that that's, that's a success <laughs> Or itself. madness. I mean, it could be just, uh, just could be a neurosis. Driven. Driven, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, driven, yeah. yeah. But I, I think so. I don't know. I see what you're saying. Yeah. The, uh, the, that, that, that concept of success maybe doesn't, doesn't need to be um, as cookie cutter or certainly prescribed as maybe we feel like it is. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, when when I do these conferences and stuff each year, more and more I'm getting clearer. Like, no, not for me. No, <laughs> not for me. Not for me. And like this, okay, I could do something with that. Not for me. You know, I don't want to go on tour. I don't want a manager. I don't want to, a lot of it. I don't want to <laughs> have a lot of Instagram followers. I don't want to learn about. Definitely don't want to learn about uh, tick. Don't want TikTok in my life at all. Yeah, yeah. You I'm know, with you on there. Yeah. Facebook ads, you know, I'll entertain the idea, but again, then I have to have an official artist mm -hmm. page and I don't at the moment. And uh, yeah. I, I don't think I'm going to go there. So, you know, but, uh, but still the camaraderie of human beings that are, we're all there for the same reason, because we mm -hmm. we want to create and share. Mm -hmm. We're not there because we want to be on Instagram and TikTok. That's, that's kind of like a secondary thing that comes from, like you said, the nature of, of the beast, but, but the people, we just want to share our music, you know? more or less that's what i find yeah so, yeah uh, I'm, i was watching this uh, diy conference with a friend of mine and kind of exposing her to um my life um getting shows and and following these conferences and just learning and and uh 
she kept kind of laughing. She's like, why is everything so hard? I mean, we just, we just want to perform. We just want to do music. Why, why is everything so complex? And I'm like, I'm, I'm telling you, like I've been wrestling with that question for 20 years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's funny, but I guess, you know, for me, I'm seeing that just stick in my, keep my head in the game, mm-hmm. not, not playing by anyone else's rules, just my own mm-hmm. and performing a service, whether it be the music vibes or, or like in this case uh, a show where people can yeah. speak and tell their story and then also to other people to have something to listen to yeah. you know it's just like a normal like I said normal whatever that is but you know yeah. uh, a conversation between two people that's civilized <laughs> and hopefully uplifting in most cases yeah. uh, I mean in all, in all cases I make sure it's not <laughs> negative but maybe not, it's not everyone's cup of tea but uh, yeah yeah, yeah um but yeah so i like we're just kind of going any which way um i do have more questions sure man let's keep rolling i mean yeah, unless see. there's other people that want to ask questions or yeah if anyone, i mean uh, i've got questions too so yeah feel free at any point just interject that i thought it was great that you looked at the title i guess and you said music philosophy and then you yeah then you put some philosophy uh <laughs> yeah topics. well let's um Um, i guess i'm an armchair philosopher you're probably going to be a bit more um savvy on 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 things but uh one of my favorite podcasts is called philosophize this and he does a great job uh breaking down the time the 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 diff the key people and the key forms of thought throughout time and and i've just been really enjoying it probably because it, it always goes along with arts like when you when you talk about whatever um again you know i apologize in advance because i uh, i'm an armchair philosopher but when you talk about the turn of the century and the uh philosophies freud's and niche whatever and then you also kind of see the art that was going along with it so you see this like visual expression or in case of music you have this philosophy of music and it's its purpose and its style and um and so yeah i kind of like i there's it's into my mind it's it's hand in hand the 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 philosophy of music nowadays is probably an an expression um it's it's being expressed through music and i'm sure you know in the future when they look back they'll have a nice clever term for this time period (laughs) that encapsulates what philosophic thinking was going on uh, but chances are it's reflected in the music and the architecture and the art um, that's happening at the same time. Yeah. So I, I think the, what we, what you're on with, with your music and philosophy, and I, I think it's, it's a really interesting subject that I enjoy hearing um, you talk about and, and your guests talk about because um, there's, it's a pretty broad, it's, there's a lot of ways to go with that. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I was trying to figure like if I do a podcast, and there were a few that I listened to f- for a few years. Uh, mm-hmm. One, some I really like, some I got some from, but I didn't want to be like them, and mm-hmm. I didn't want to be like any of them per- specifically. I want to be my own voice, but some I liked a little more than others. Uh, the one I liked the most didn't have guests. It was like a, this oratory, this uh, monologue every time, and mm-hmm. I just don't really. I never believed that people i tried the monologue i did a lot of videos of this over the years and it didn't seem like too many people were into it mm-hmm. and i didn't i didn't have this drive to do it so i figured mm-hmm. I mean, wouldn't it be more of a service if i one of my favorite things to do is talk about my life story mm-hmm. so what if i gave other people that chance <laughs> and then in between i give snippets of my life story and then by the time my, you know my autobiography comes out which i'm deep uh chest deep in right now okay and there might be some people who want who care you know to read it so uh that was kind of my thinking um and like i said i I used to hang out in the basement where i grew up and Mm -hmm. uh, always had guests and um from high school days into college days and it was this kind of like gathering of we used to have something called philosophy night and we have the coffee pot going and we go Mm -hmm. way into the you know sugar and, and and milk and way into late in the night and all sorts of, you know, of course, it was very uncouth and uh, a lot of dirty stuff came up in there, too. But uh, young guys, but there was some serious philosophy. And compared to what other kids were doing a few blocks away, just getting sure. wasted and causing trouble, it was, mm-hmm. it was pretty sophisticated, yeah. you know, and, and I, I can contact 
pretty much most of the guys who were involved with that years ago. And some of them yeah. have been on the show and, and they speak to that. So I just thought we can't be in my basement anymore. Mm -hmm. And I know so many more people now. So what if I did that same mm -hmm. vibe as a, uh, you know, as a interview series type of thing, yeah, or no. occasionally group talk, you know, totally. No, I think there's a lot of value to that for sure. Um, yeah, cool. Appreciate well, it. it. Cause I kind of, uh, so, uh, uh, I perform my music stuff, but then I also do this comedy improv thing. And that feels very much kind of similar in, in this place we could go late night hours um, as, as a group of friends, but it was more about uh, uh, trying to be creative together and constructive and positive. It was, um, yeah, there might've been drinking involved, but um, the, uh, the overall goal was definitely having uh, something that. Uh, uh, felt like you were a part of a group felt, um, and yeah, that, that it made some friendships that, that I, I've had for 20 years, 20 years now, if I think about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I saw that you're doing comedy. So how does comedy fit into your, the puzzle of your life? Um, well, so, um, yeah, comedy improv, um, is something that's always been kind of my weekend thing, I guess. Um, I've been involved in a couple of troops, so I was able to travel around to some other comedy improv festivals in like Chicago and uh, Denver. Um, and uh, it's it's always been a fascinating art form for me. I love I love how it's very um, it, it, it's it can be really quite positive um, because of these sort of improv philosophies of of looking out for the other person and just going with it, just being like, just being agreeable with whatever choice is made on stage and and opening yourself up to the what's called the group mind when 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 I watch a show and I just see these eight people like lock in on the same idea at the same time and you can feel it you know th these were like these are miraculous things that I saw that um, um, I've always just been fascinated with I always enjoyed it um, it's also around Salt Lake it's it's a big kind of family entertainment industry where you, you bring you a date you bring a family and you, the whole goal is to try and make people laugh and make mistakes and and sort of celebrate those mistakes and so um mm -hmm. uh with that all in mind i'm kind of i uh i bring the guitar too so i bring uh, an, uh the ability to make up songs on certain certain things and um and uh, uh be able to just add music to a number of different projects so um the one i'm involved with right now is called toy soup with beans and that's mm -hmm. basically my two friends. When I talk about these people that I've known for a long time, uh, these are two guys that uh, we've done improv together. This is the first time where the three of us have really tried to uh, polish a product that can be that can perform. So uh, we've been out to California for some shows. We set up shows here. Um, and the whole idea, though, is that it's uh, a comedy improv, but there's always going to be songs that we make up along the way. And mm -hmm. uh, a buddy of mine does beatbox. Uh, we're all trying to work on harmonies. So it's uh, when, when those nights are locked in and, and we are, we're all on the same page, um, man, it's, 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 it's a hoot and it's, it's powerful too. I think it's really profound to, to coordinate um, like that. It's kind of watching like a, a sports team when you're like, Ooh, those, the, you know, those, that basketball team is hot right now. Cause they're all you know, they're all doing their job and they just become this force of nature because of the sum of their parts. Um, mm -hmm. So um, that's kind of the, the comedy improv side of what I'm doing. And then I write songs that are comedic. So on Pocket Octaves, there's a song called Captain's Log that was just sort of a funny idea that I wanted to flush out. And... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I heard that one. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I got that uh, the com comedy edge on, on that. And yeah. yeah, when I think of you, in general, from my brief experience in person and just whatever online vibe, I do feel generally like it's fun, you know, and not necessarily always funny or anything, but like a fun guy, you know, who yeah. can be funny as well as yeah. serious too, you know. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that that's great. Would you compare the the troop thing uh, to being in a band, the comedy troop? Um, I think there's some similarities. Um, but uh, I, I couldn't quite say it's like a band, although I don't know. That's maybe what we are doing in my experience is really quite different um, because of the, the no, the, there's, there's certain things we rehearse on, but when the show happens, like it's really like 
it's we we get a suggestion from the audience and it can go any which way um i think kind of in the band you have you have a pretty scripted regimen you um mm -hmm. and 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 a lot of the rehearsals are about getting that thing right um and then also understanding kind of where people's you know responsibilities are so the drummer's job is to play the drums and that's kind of all he has you know Mm -hmm. um, and and the guitar players focus on the guitar. So you know, having the guitar player kind of worry about the drums is is counterproductive. Mm -hmm. But with this, it's like there's this whole concept of like you're you're trying to you're you're throwing a balloon in the air and you're trying to just tap it and keep it up in the air. And sometimes some sometimes there's one guy that can't get to it, and that mm -hmm. means somebody else has to fill in. And, right. and then it becomes this juggling act that um, I think is quite different from being in a band. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, cool. No, just, just curious. Um, uh, did, did you meet uh, Bob Baker when we were in, uh, or are you familiar with Bob Baker? I know his name. I don't know. Th I, I, I think I know who, you, who he is. Um, I don't think I met him though, no. He's, a, yeah, he's an author, he empowers um, uh, musicians and, and writers, um, entrepreneurs. A uh, really cool guy, and he does a uh, improv comedy. He coaches it for years. Oh, okay. like that's one yeah. of his, you know, his uh, um, hats, you know, that he wears. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, he he, he loves it. Oh, baby, that's actually I know that name. Um, uh, it's it's an interesting skill. I mean, the truth is, I think it it exercises um, it exercises a level of humani humanity that um, you know it's not really taught in schools. It's not taught it's not this uh, the, mm -hmm. an intelligence that's really valued because I, I also think you can't really quantize it. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's basic sort of sharing and caring and, and looking out for each other and listening. It's these really basic concepts, but, you know, as an adult, when you, when you really have that actively going on, um, we just get along better, you know, society functions better. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's, uh, hmm. so I find it pretty fascinating. Um, I'm thinking about teaching um, and, and whatnot, but uh, I, 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 my other favorite part of it is kind of how subjective it all is. Like mm -hmm. the there's a lot of people being like, and I've been to these workshops and, and I, and I, I don't want to discredit them or whatever, but they do come into this, like, well, there's only one way to do it. There's only one way to do this scene. There's only one way to take that suggestion. And I'm kind of like, well, but that's the whole point is that <laughs> there's, there's, there's infinite amounts of ways to go. We just so happen to go down this way and yeah. none of that's neither bad or wrong or, Maybe it's more palatable. Maybe it doesn't work. Maybe it doesn't do what you want it to do. But the idea of going into it with this sort of like, it has to be this way. I'm, I'm kind of like, not. Nah. Mm -hmm. I, I like a broader idea of how things can work out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, definitely. I, I'm with you on that. Yeah, improv comedy. I, um, I recently did, um, I tried Qigong, a Qigong class. Oh, yeah, I'm familiar with the Kung Fu, right? The Qigong, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. uh, Qigong is yeah, it's more like this energetic thing, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and it was mixed with Pilates a little bit, which I don't love because my core is kind of weak. but Because um, it hurts. You know, because it, it hurts. Yeah, I feel like I suck at it, basically. Yeah. <laughs> but um, anyway, in part of this particular teacher's Qigong is, is like laughing, laughing yoga, uh, uh -huh. where you, you laugh out loud for... He did it for a minute this time, last time, but sometimes people do it five minutes. Yeah. Very hard for me. You know, um, I could laugh. I have a good sense of humor. I believe uh, I love telling corny jokes. I'll tell them to the tone sure. blue in the face, but, yeah. uh, but just laughing on cue, I can't do it. I don't know if yeah. you're able to do that, but uh, it must be super healthy to just, I, I, at least being a comedy team, you're laughing a lot more, probably. You, you know, I, I, I think I am healthier because I've spent a lot of time laughing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I've, and I've heard about this laughing yoga, I think. Um, and uh, but that's kind of funny because now I'm imagining you like in a yoga class laughing for five minutes. <laughs> and, and to me, that's that that would be a funny thing to see. <laughs> yeah, it, it was it was uh, on. Uh, on, on through the computer so maybe in person okay. the vibes would come through and I, it would like yeah. infect me yeah but uh it, i just couldn't do it on, with the screen 
Well, the laughter is contagious. I mean, uh, yeah. when I when I do shows, um, I have my 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 toy soup and beans. That's kind of our specialty show that I do. But I'll I'll be a part of other troops, and you'll you can tell that when there's a bigger crowd, um, they're almost easier because there's more people laughing, getting other people involved mm -hmm. uh, because of their laughter, um, and uh, yeah, it's just contagious. So, <laughs> you, you, I'm sure it would be a different experience if you were like in the room with other people laughing, and then it, then it becomes genuinely funny. You know? Right, right. Somehow, <laughs> right. yeah, and yeah, I know I I'm, feel healthier when I get a really good laugh. It's almost like a really good cry, you know. It's like sure. it massages parts of your body that, mm -hmm. that you can't massage otherwise. Oh, well, there's got to be brain chemicals happening too. There's mm -hmm. got to be uh, all sorts of perks. The intake of oxygen, I'm sure, is part of that. And, yeah. 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 And just like kind of like maybe super present moment, right? You can't mm -hmm. you can't like get lost in your thoughts when you're laughing hard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Or or with those things that catch you off guard, the things that take you out of your left brain, and they just happen to you, and you laugh because of it. It's this response um, mm -hmm. that that I think can be. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a, it's a primal thing to laugh, to, to enjoy mm -hmm. things, to be amused uh, <laughs> to, and to share that. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's cool. I, I definitely uh, applaud your, uh, sort of commitment to that, uh, part of your life. You know? Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Um, it feels a little odd though. I mean, being a 40 year old and having done this for so long, I, you know, I have, I do have this uh critic in my mind being like man you 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 should have been doing something else or you, there could have been other things you could have been doing and i have to remind myself well that well i i enjoy it it, it brings joy to me so it's it's uh, but it's interesting to kind of wrestle with that demon myself so i could i could see that uh, but uh, i'm sure it brings joy to other people too you know? yeah here's here's to hoping yeah i mean <laughs> yeah. I, I imagine uh, but then, yeah, that, that, like you said, um, you were thinking about teaching improv. I think you said that. You said, yeah, you brought up improv yeah. comedy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, um, if you check out Bob Baker's improv comedy and what he does, he's always sends, yeah. he puts these pictures of this troop, you know, this, you know, of, of beginners that he's teaching and everyone's smiling. And I yeah. think he's doing like, a, I get the sense that what he's doing is, is a public service. Of course, you know, he gets paid whatever amount, but yeah. that he arranges. But it seems like he's, it's like almost a uh, therapy too for people. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, 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 we've always, um, t I've talked about this idea for lots of people where it's almost like a, uh, a corporate training, like, I don't know, a company, you know, team building exercises where a lot of it is just address, uh, conveying these core concepts of comedy improv and, and, uh, it's kind of giving, uh, people who are in careers like, I don't know, computer programmers who are in their computers all the time, they just don't have that social interaction. They don't have that exercising of, of learning how to listen to someone or read something or, uh, ha you know, have, have a sense of humor about something that uh, um, I think is a pretty valuable trait. And I, I'm willing to bet it's going to become even more and more valuable as time goes on because we're becoming more and more isolated. Like, being able to function in a social circumstance is becoming more and more difficult. Um, and a large part of that's because these skills that uh, comedy improv, you need, you need to have these skills to be, to be successful uh, um, at, at, a, at a show. Um, they just, they're just not as commonplace. No, no. I could think about uh, when I got together with some, my old group of friends uh, in January, like we're, we're all scattered now. We just decided, oh, screw, we're going to get together and hung out for a few hours at night, some drinks. And yeah. within minutes, we're just laughing our heads off. And somehow, <laughs> like we have that, we know how to rib each other just enough to get to get the group to laugh and, but not to piss anyone off, you know, yeah. and send them, you know. And, uh, and then since then, this particular group of friends, we've kept this, uh, a group chat you know, a group text thing um, since January, which is just very unusual. There's this particular group has never like been done that, but we just felt we were so happy hanging out that day that we just would keep sharing whatever music and a joke or here and there. And, yeah. But, it, you know, we need each other. That, those, those like very fundamental things, hanging out with friends in high school, or those basement days, joking around or whatever. Yeah, um, that sort of like, 
taking jabs at each other, but in a very kind of constructive way, I guess, or this, this, uh, uh, you have a rapport so you can, you can get a, get a laugh out of each other, but maybe, um, yeah, I, I find, I find that interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, and that's what it tends to be about, right. With, certainly with guys, uh, mm -hmm. you can't help but make it a little bit, um, yeah, aggressive. It could be a very friendly way, but, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. Yeah. So, um, want to jump into the conference? I, I, yeah. I don't think we yeah. have to follow a map here. Just anything that we'd like to talk about. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. What was your experience like? Um, it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was good. I, I'm always, uh, I was trying to kind of explain this before we got on the, uh, uh, the call. Um, but the, the, the vibe was the same kind of vibe I recall having been to the actual conference. And it was one of, it was very positive. It was one of, uh, you're not alone. You're, we're here to help. Um, you've got, um, yeah, because you're not alone, that means you have, you know, resources, you just have to open up your eyes to, um, and, and put some, you know, focus and discipline into it. Um, and, and, uh, I think what CD baby does is, is pretty solid. Um, so, um, I, I walked away with that same same feeling of like, okay, I I'm seeing improvement in my life, I'm seeing some ways in which I can grow, and then in the meantime, I don't feel so alone. Like I don't feel like mm -hmm. um, the the album that I released is is I shouldn't be embarrassed about that. You know, there's somebody else just like me doing the same thing, just kind of in their own genre, in their own part of the world. And mm -hmm. uh, and that's good. It's a comforting thought to me. I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I don't think too. I can relax a bit more about what I, who I am and what I'm accomplishing. And, cool. Uh, yeah. And, and focus, but yeah. What about you? What was kind of your general takeaway? Mm -hmm. So just to, for anyone who's listening for clarity purposes, we're talking about the CD baby DIY musicians conference, uh, 2021, which this year was virtual and previous years has been besides last year, which was canceled due to the pandemic has been in person. Um, ben and I met at Austin, Texas, and uh, that's just going to be in Austin next year. Uh, that's the plan anyway. So yeah, my general takeaway, um, I'm, I was happy it wasn't in person this year, not because I'm afraid of, uh, you know, the virus. That's, that's not it. Um, I just, uh, because of, every, you know, the restrictions and everything, I don't think traveling would be so fun and, and other people being so nervous about who knows what comes up in the news today and then people are a flutter and I probably the, yeah. the people who um, are running it would have to be extra nervous because of all their responsibility. So I'm glad it wasn't in person for that. Uh, and I did like being home. You know, I would choose whichever ones I want to go to then go up and have lunch. You know, I could still run to my mom's and do gardening the same day that I was at the conference, which was kind of cool. Uh, or even take a bike ride in between classes just to kind of get fresh air. So I like that. And I was able to take, I didn't take, I did take a lot of notes, you know, by hand. Um, but I also had this other window open and I was, um, of course, I don't know if you saw some of those uh, courses or whatever you want to call them, classes had tons of uh, chatting going on. Right? Yeah, I, I was playing around with it. Sometimes I sat it there, sometimes I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah. So at some point I was like, you know what, let me just, you know, sometimes I, I try to zone, tune it out, but sometimes I was engaging and I was hitting people's um, websites or the YouTube pages yeah. and then it would open up and then I would just uh, add them to my favorites or something so I can go back and find them and then yeah. check everyone out. Yeah. So through doing that, so I guess my general takeaway was kind of this, well, twofold. One, I got clear on who I am and what I yeah. want to do. Mm -hmm. And then two, similar to yourself, like feeling a bit better about where I am and what I've achieved. I also saw what we, most of us artists want is to be seen and heard. Mm -hmm. And like you, like you said, you feel good that you're taking steps, challenging yourself, experimenting, seeing what works and just putting yourself out there. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that's what the, the sort of like the wisdom you're getting from the conference. That's what you've been doing. So you felt good about that. Uh, similarly, I felt like, yes, I'm, I was reading, people want to be seen and heard. And that's what I'm service I'm providing, like with this podcast, yeah. 
Yeah. And, you know, and just in, in general, like I, I could just check out their websites and give them a thumbs up on one video, just encourage somebody uh, and uh, also see how complicated most people's websites are yeah. to learn that it, I don't like looking at that. So how can I simplify my own website, you know? Mm. Yeah. So I got that feeling and like, man, we all just want a little bit of attention. I would scream for attention. If I give people attention, that's probably good. And then of course, what do you know? When, when I do that, people reciprocate. You get and a response. Yeah. Yeah. Then I get someone mm -hmm. subscribes to my <clears throat> mailing list or my uh, YouTube. Yeah. So that, that's kind yeah. of, that, that's how I approached it. It's yeah. more like, how can I make it more of a community? That's awesome. Cause that's a, I think that's essentially, um, that's what that whole conference is really good at is um, connecting um, all these people in their various phases of their career in the various knowledges of, of whatever they do. Um, and then, and then rattling it in the bag and, and, and yeah, you kind of, it, uh, I think kind of like the, with that improv, it's sort of like anything could happen. There's a whole bunch of ways this could go uh, because mm -hmm. of, of that, of that, uh, community that they're developing and uh yeah i think you're i think you're absolutely right when what the service you provide that there is this sort of uh you know i, I can play mu music but um it's a lot better when it's heard when it's recognized when it's when it's not just me in my room because i can do that all the time uh, but but having somebody else uh, be there is a is a uh um well that's part of the growth um that has to happen um, with the feedback, with getting an idea of, of, oh, this is, this is what I like. And this is what I don't like, or this is the, this is, um, who I'm becoming and this is versus, versus maybe who I want to be in terms of branding and music and marketing and whatever. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Yeah. I, I felt, um, that, that they're really fortunate to choose or find that, uh, woman, um, Wendy Parr. Yeah. Was she a great session? Yeah. Imagine what, what the heck would they do if they didn't have someone who knew how to lead a, you know, interactive um, network. Because yeah. yeah. that, that was such a key component to have that chance to meet people. It, I, and it was so <clears throat> unique, too, because it was this exchange. It wasn't like sit and watch me. It wasn't sit and listen to me. It was like there was this conversation going. I mean, it was her on the Zoom call with any millions of people. But there was this this feedback happening. There was this um, mm -hmm. uh, just conversation that, that yeah, that was neat. And I've never done that sort of break off meetings, which I thought was really cool. Um, yeah, because I, I ended up ended up in two rooms with some Australian, with some people from Australia, and just kind of understanding what it's like to be a singer songwriter out in Australia right now. <laughs> like it, it really was like, oh gosh, I never you know. Nah, nah, uh, <laughs> fathom that and then made a connection with a producer in, in uh, uh, Saigon oh, I have to I forgot I, I want to say the, the country right but you know he's in a different country but mm -hmm. he's a he's a producer and, it, and in a way it's a very complementing skill that he's trying to hone that is the sort of skill I'm looking for um, because I have my skill that I'm trying to hone mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think yeah that's, that's yeah who knows what kind of you know, um, things can emerge from those rooms. Uh, like I, I found at least three people who were interested to be a guest in the show um, mm -hmm. that I think will be. And through that, you know, you know sometimes when I have a, a podcast that I, or interview, I just learn some, something, you know, one little bit of information that I wouldn't have known that that becomes useful. Or I just begin to feel more comfortable in my own skin sometimes like just because you know hearing where other people are at and other people's journeys i i get a different perspective on you know i can appreciate my own journey you know mm -hmm. um, no and so i mean kudos to you and more power to you i think i think what your what your 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 music and philosophy this whole thing is really onto something and i can see it keep getting better so yeah i appreciate it i, I got gotta be careful not to burn out on it because it can take a lot of <laughs> you know it's like a job that you know that i just sure. threw upon myself because i want yeah. to try it but yeah. uh I, I do i do think it's uh, i feel good about it as long as i pace it yeah. um so joao has uh another question he says um for you he says um <clears throat> do you think it's possible oh <laughs> do you think it's possible that 
both of you can help my social project in Brazil with QR code. Uh, people used to do that in the USA to help social projects. Man. I'm not sure what that means. Well, so here's the thing, because like we're talking another country and I have no idea. I have no idea what <laughs> the QR code process is like um, and setting up websites and, and, and uh, yeah. well, I mean, I, I, I'm sure it's, it's basically the same, but aren't there, aren't there like sort of like, I don't know, governmental restrictions on some of that stuff? Like, yeah, or, um, it's probably, it's, uh, it's probably a task I would love to do because mm -hmm. I'm a, I'm a yes, yes, and type, but uh, <laughs> uh, I, I wouldn't know where to start. Um, yeah, yeah, Joana, I'm sorry, I, I don't, I have no clue on, on, on that information and uh, I can't imagine um, I would be too useful for you on that. Um, so I would think you, you need to know the laws of Brazil as well, which I don't know, but he, thank you yeah. for asking. I do wonder though, if um, it might not be directly on topic, but um, this idea that um, you've kind of made a buzz for yourself out in Brazil in a different country and like maybe maybe part of what he's trying to accomplish might need to be developed somewhere else so like if the idea is to sort of create a social scene of some sort to create a buzz for is it how do you say his name again Joadel uh, João João yeah. Um, but yeah maybe maybe the idea is to get attention in the United States uh, the same way you're getting attention in Brazil I don't know <laughs> just kind of ki yeah, kicking just, the uh, idea around yeah, well, thanks for the question, Juan. I mean, Bor uh, Sorci, amigo, uh, now say, now say. Um, yeah, basically, like uh, Ben and I are talking about, we just kind of <clears throat> find our way and we just keep on doing what we, what our hearts are moving us to do from day to day, you know, while staying authentic. Yeah, um, going back to the conference, I think that was the other big takeaway was this experimentation, like all the Facebook uh, algorithms. Instagram is probably the one I'm going to be working on next, begrudgingly. Um, mm -hmm. But there's so many little, little um, features that um, I, I mean, I, I, I guess I could go online and try and get some sort of like tutorial uh, on each of the parts of how to Instagram all the different effects and stuff. But um, no, so much of it's just experimenting. Um, and, mm -hmm. and so I guess, uh, yeah, that was from the conference. It was, I think, a comforting notion that nobody, nobody's got a silver bullet answer. Um, everyone's discovered their own path, kind of doing things their own way, being authentic to themselves, and then being open to, to, to you know, the positive things that help them get to their goals. Um, but so, yeah, mm -hmm. I like, like the idea of just experimenting, continuing to experiment and in a way experimenting will never end. You're always going to be experimenting. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I kind of wish I was into Instagram, but, uh, I'm, I'm, I pulled it away. I purposely pulled it away from myself, yeah. not to say other people shouldn't do it or anything, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll just briefly explain why, because I've really been writing my book books and uh focusing on that and um anything that is kind of uh distraction from deep thinking deep deep process thinking i try to just reduce as much as possible so i'm only facebook and youtube pretty much yeah. right now yeah um makes sense makes a lot of sense yeah but because that's what I, I find myself doing part of that experimenting process is sucking time for me it's sucking energy sucking mental strength because i'm just trying to troubleshoot on my phone for out for an hour and <laughs> i have a little i have little to show for it you know um so um yeah i don't see myself doing tiktok um but YouTube, um, I'm trying to develop the YouTube with uh, more videos of the sign language in my music. I think YouTube is probably going to be a big component of not just experimenting, but really having some key things I want to, goals I want to accomplish on that. Mm -hmm. But again, it's that's still experimenting. It's just maybe in a more focused way. Yeah, I think it is. Um, I, I'm, I'm not the biggest proponent of YouTube. You know, it is, it is a monster, but... Um, at the same time, uh, that's that's my strongest presence besides my my website. Even even stronger than my website in a way. Yeah. But of course, if YouTube vanished tomorrow, then it would be gone. 
Yeah. So my web presence is there. But uh, what I like about YouTube is that it's it's kind of like the least of the social medias in the sense that if you put something up there, you're you're putting something up there. So it's very creative. Mm -hmm. uh, the other ones could be very reactive. Of course, you can go on YouTube and just react. But I mean, if you're going to develop a channel, then you got to you have to be creative. Mm -hmm. So um, I like it because well, I initially started YouTube in 2008 just to park videos for yeah. my uh, my website. I'm like, OK, yeah. well, maybe someone's going to want to see this live performance and I have to put it somewhere and YouTube is where you put it. Um, but I didn't think I was going to grow a channel, not till several years later. But uh, I, I've been doing it very much my natural way, uh, and it grows little by little. I feel like I'm the tortoise, you know, tortoise in the hair on the tortoise. And slowly but surely, over since 2014, since I started building it, <clears throat> it's, you know, sometimes you lose, but mainly over the long haul, I've gained some subscribers. Not that that means anything. When I look at my stats, my, the views of my videos is like 2% of my subscribers. So I don't know why we were concerned about subscribers, but uh, okay. it's, weird it's, okay. it's, it's a weird vanity yeah. met, met, uh, metric. Yeah. But yeah. Um, yeah. but it feels, you know, it feels good to, that people would at least choose to hit the button, you know. Yeah. Um, but, but like I said, it's something I could build on. Where I felt Instagram and, and Facebook, I just can't build anything. But Facebook, you can if, if you have official page, I guess. But and you can have this catalog of things on Instagram, but I just felt it was such like quicksand, you know, just everything just falling through. Yeah. And what am I? Who am I? Am I trying to impress someone? I know that I don't spend any time on anyone's Instagram thing for more than a second. Boop, beep, boop, like boop, mm -hmm. and that what must be what other people are doing to mine. Yeah. So there's yeah. what's the? How can I gain any true fans there? You know, that's how I felt. Yeah. So I, I just I got a certain number of followers approved that I could do it after yeah, eight mm -hmm. months or so. I just put it to the yeah. side and said, or a year, I don't know what I did. Yeah, that that Facebook, because um, I'm the same way. I'm go, I'll scroll through and just kind of see if anything. Uh, you know, there's groups I'm involved with. There's like local musicians and there's uh, gear swaps and and you'll you'll you'll, you'll have the possibility, I guess, of opportunities for shows or if people need. So there's there's that kind of component that is always kind of interesting, but. Um, more important than that, I think it's just the whole event thing where like setting up an event page for any of the live shows that I do. Um, that's just an easy way to make telling people where to go and what and when it's at and that sort of thing. Um, but um, you, you, you can kill you can still kind of do that other ways. Um, so I guess uh, with, with that, and this is kind of that's the only thing that I'm really kind of find helpful. And then with Instagram, Instagram, the only oh, oh, that, that, with, Facebook. with Facebook, and then Instagram, the only helpful thing would be the idea that I could broaden and draw in more attention and find more interest in my music, um, get more su subscribers. But um, I'm with you. I, I, that number is so much more of just a vanity me metric. That's um, I guess it. I yeah. I guess it could be pretty insightful. Maybe it's just not that useful right now. Because it's not, there's not a lot going on. There's not a lot of uh, a data coming in, you know. If I suppose there was like thousands of clicks and views, you'd get a a, a more round, uh, a more uh, solid understanding of what trends were happening. But I kind of in, in mm -hmm. my my current independent state, it's, it's not very helpful. Yeah, like I, I would think if 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 either you're really into it, or um, if you had a team, or like one or two people who could. <clears throat> focus on that for you, then that presence would be very valuable probably. Yeah. But since we have to also create the music and record it and live our lives, that aren't, that additional, very shallow additional work, I don't think it's helpful well, for the most part. I mean, mm -hmm. maybe people just perform and they don't actually have to, I don't know, mm -hmm. it's not for me, that's all I know. Yeah, no, you're right. That's where a team starts to develop. I think uh, behind artists and and any and anyone that's successful, they you know they have they have a, they have to cre credit the people that were helping them get there. Um, and uh, um, I could see just like you would have a writer or a producer or a recording engineer. There's now there's that social PR role. That's like a a, a position in somebody's team 
that uh, all they do is focus on that because it's, it takes that much time. It takes that much expertise and skill. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm not interested in it. <laughs> no. And why should you be? But at the same time, we have the chance to be right because yeah. we're DIY. Right. We we're information that we can access, you know, it's another one of those hats that we kind of have to wear for the time being. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one thing I, I think I, I think I learned from Bob Baker, that guy I mentioned before, yeah, was yeah. this this idea of tracking your progress. Uh, and I made a chart. I don't use it anymore, but because mm -hmm. uh, I, I did like this one on one coaching with him, and he gave me a questionnaire, and I answered it, and <clears throat> he said, "Oh, well, it's pretty good. You have this. You know, at the time, like you have five subscribers on on YouTube, and you have this many uh, followers here, and then." I just got me thinking, so I put in a chart, and every every month I would update how many followers I have. Sometimes I lost, sometimes I gained. Mm -hmm. Then after a year or two years, you start to see, wow, I guess I am developing something. Yeah. And it kept me feeling like I, you know, it kept me like uh, having a sense of momentum. When when yeah. those days when you feel really crappy, you're like, my sure, what am I doing any of this for? You know. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, that's a that's a good. I guess, I guess point that vanity metrics as vain as it is, it still can kind of be, um, really helpful to, to, uh, shift your funk or, or recognize mm -hmm. growth when there is growth. Uh, so. Yeah. Right. Like in its proper place, I think it's, mm -hmm. it could be useful. There is truth to it. Right. If, if, mm -hmm. if you've been doing something for X amount of years and there's a lot of more subscribers than for the less effort, you could see there's some cause and effect relationship, you know? So, but uh, yeah, not to get swept away by it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so one of your questions, I know you had that Carl Jung in there. Oh um, yeah, well, so like, um, just kind of maybe going more into the philosophy side of things. Um, what, um, what, uh, what kind of songs do you think have the most impact on people? And I, like, and that could be your own songs or that could be just certain songs in general. Like, what do you, what do you think, uh, what music do you think has the most impact on people? Hmm. It's uh, a couple of different ways I could look at it. Uh, well, I, I watched this, um, you know, Rick Beato. I know, the, I know the name, but I don't think I know. Yeah, he does, he does a lot of YouTube videos and he kind of analyzes yeah. songs and he uh, plays guitar and he talks, uh, today I watched a video about Spotify and the most popular artists on Spotify. Okay. And now some of the old classic artists like Jimi Hendrix are fading. They're not popular anymore. You know, just kind of interesting. Um, okay. But uh, anyway, I think that one of the most popular artists on Spotify, can you guess? Um, if I'm right, is it John Denver? Uh, it could be. I don't, well, okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's he, he that's my guess. Everyone. He didn't check everyone. Uh, oh. Yeah, what what did you find out? What Queen? Queen. Okay. Queen is super did relevant he, right now. And and yeah, did he say why? Like uh, it... he, you don't know why, you know. I mean, he just, he didn't, unless you look into it, I guess. But yeah. um, like they're twice as popular as the Beatles in terms of numbers. Wow. Wow. And who would guess that? And they're, they're a lot more uh, popular than some of the other, um, like Taylor Swift and other artists like that. Okay. Yeah. So. Uh, I mean, there was a movie that came out, but when when I think about songs that impact a lot of people, mm -hmm. can't help but think about Bohemian Rhapsody. Um, who doesn't know that song? And who can't help themselves? Like Mamma <laughs> Mia, you know? They, they, there's a and yeah, that's that's a that's a great song. Yeah, it, it, it's a great song for whatever for what that's whatever that's worth. But it's also not a great song because it's lyrically not great you know it's <laughs> in terms of like it's depressing and and yeah. pretty much negative okay uh, i just killed a man put a gun against his head what the hell is that you know but everyone's singing it and they're not thinking like oh a beautiful song <laughs> you know <laughs> what the hell is this song about it, i have no nobody knows but uh you know my wife is loves it i, I bought her the sheet music but she loves queen so she's learning it instrumentally on yeah. piano and she's like, how can I rearrange the lyrics so I could sing it? And she's thinking about doing like an Earth Ranger. You know, she likes to, to pick up garbage in the neighborhood to help clean the neighborhood. So maybe <laughs> something in that vein. Okay, I like it. You know, like... but for whatever reason, that song speaks to so many people. Yeah. Um, 
gosh, you know, so it had, you know, it, the, the Queen movie did come out, but then there was like Wayne's World that uh, had mm-hmm. that whole car scene that was, yeah. um, I'm sh- and I'm, there's some sort of story about how they were like, they needed to get the rights for that song and they went through all sorts of hassle, but the truth is it had to be that song. They couldn't mm-hmm. have done that scene with a different song. Yeah, um, no way. And, uh, but then I also think of that song being so interactive um, and it changes mm. a lot. It's, it's, it's a roller coaster ride. And, yeah. and, and that means it's easy for people to kind of jump on and, and uh, I mean, it's a yeah. karaoke classic, you know, it's, it's, uh, um, but so that's, that's interesting uh, that it's queen. It's kind of that trend right now. And, and another one that pops to mind in terms of like songs that really for, for whatever reason carry over for the majority of people yeah. Adele. Okay. Yeah, like Rolling in the Deep. Her, she had a billion plus listens or whatever. Okay. I mean, I I I, I make that face because it's uh, <laughs> I, I would hate to have written that song and and okay. sing it, you know, because yeah, or, or or any of those. I would hate to write a, a sad love song and have to be singing for the rest of my career, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Or or like a vengeful love song, whatever. Like Lance Marset did. Uh, you want to know, you know, that yeah, would suck yeah. to sing that all the time, you know. Yeah, because that's what the people want. They want to hear that song over and over and over again. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I don't know. People do like sad songs mm-hmm. and ones with a little bit of a fork twist in yeah. them. Uh, but anyway, my, my my book that I'm writing now, uh, besides my autobiography, which I'm deep in as well, but this book, it's about to come out in the fall. It's called okay. Mind Your Music. And it's about the energy of music and how we should, I implore the reader to be super conscious of what are you exposing yourself to mm. <clears throat> because it's vibration and it can affect you in a healthy or unhealthy way. And most of the music that we're exposed to, I would argue, is gray area. So it's in between tending a little bit towards the toxic side because our music is being fueled by this uh, profit-driven you know, system. So it's not going to, it's going to be more inclined to want to hook you uh, or to, you know, to, to pray, to pray on your, your weaker parts than, than, than not. Um, so, I mean, so I do think there's plenty of healthy music too, or what I would call uh, white uh, light magic music. And, and then we get into the whole field of sound healing and, uh, yeah. You know, so if you talk about what music I love to listen to, it definitely would not be Bohemian Rhapsody, although I appreciate it. Mm-hmm. You know, what kind of music do you think people are, are drawn to? Let's say like the current state of humanity on the whole. Uh, um, I don't know. I, um, I think you're right. I think that currently we're, we're, being, we're being sucked in by that sugary, sweet produced music. Um, and that, you know, the lyricism is more about being entertaining and maybe provocative to just spur to spark something. Um, and I don't know if that's the healthiest way of going about it. Uh, um, and then, in, yeah, I think on, I agree that sound healing uh, is the sound is is what's it's kind of hard to explain, but the sound in general is so overlooked you know no pun intended there's the the uh, you only know you only know that uh, a band like uh, music or a, a sound guy is not doing their job when when it's uncomfortable if you're like sitting in a restaurant and everything's fine and you're having a good time and there's music in the background it's a really effortless thing i think mm-hmm. and um and i think that's sort of the 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 catch is is um uh, this the music that's coming out here uh, now and what's part of the machine um, um, it's it's very consciously using sound uh, against us it's 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 using frequencies to make us do something and that might mean I'm making you dance by doing a beat sure um, but you know that I think of a lot of the r and b um, even the new country kind of stuff that's um, kind of like, uh, it's, it feels very transparent. It feels very shallow. It feels like I, I've, I kind of know, I know, I know where this is going. I know, I know. And, uh, and I can get over it pretty quickly. Um, 
mm-hmm. the uh, the the stuff that I kind of that I revisit and that I stick with tend to be very. Um, I know what a, a perfect circle would be a great example of that. That's mm-hmm. a that's a, a broad spectrum of sound that I always find interesting. Like looking at a masterpiece where there's there's just nuances on this particular system that I, or I just have to really appreciate how somebody's mind put that out. So somebody's mind came up with it and then they were able to capture it. Um, and after producing an album, you know, there's another layer of like, oh, how do you even record a snare like that? How do you make that bass hit so well? Um, mm-hmm. And it's, and there's that, that's, and that's where the, the, I think that healing part of it uh, is still there. It's not, it's not, it's not gone. There's, there's definitely artists that understand that and they're doing that. Um, but uh, yeah, the state right now, and it's it's about making the song that goes well with the TikTok. It's about making a 15 second thing that just Ugh. captures everybody's attention. And if you can do that much, you're golden. And so everyone's just trying to make a 15 minute thing that's like in your face and you can do a TikTok to. And, uh, and it's exhausting. It's mm-hmm. yeah. draining, draining, draining. Mm-hmm. Like it, music's not meant to be 15 seconds, you know, I, I no. would, I would argue. <laughs> no, you know, um, it's I, communication. I, it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, one of my soapbox, when I do a live show, I, I kind of talk about these songs that I've learned. So when I, I, I actually, I, this reminds me of a question I'm going to, I'm going to ask you after this, but, um, you know, I do covers and originals and I try to sort of preface like, oh, I'm doing this cover, but there's a real reason I'm doing this cover. Like this is a Johnny Cash cover and he's an American songwriter guy in black uh, doing, doing this song that's iconic. And, and it speaks to me because yada, yada. And then off I go playing the song. Um, but I think that's where the uh, 15 seconds is just, isn't enough for me. I'm, I'm still hungry afterwards. I, I want something, I want a story behind. I want, I want a, something that piques my interests and then, and then also gives me a nice resolve at the end. Um, and uh yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I, yeah, that's the 15 second thing. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's like, it plays, it really plays right into the hands of this ADHD generation. <laughs> and it's not like, I'm not condemning anyone who has ADHD, but it's it's like, it's trying to like, make that normalize that we all well, it's, should. It's cultivating it, I would argue. Yeah, yeah. Right, It's right. actually actively making people have shorter tension spans. Right, and then, then people who have really quality well thought out rich music uh people have less patience for that because they're not they're not trained to listen to it and i just on, on a side note i have to mention when i listen to your album mm-hmm. pocket octaves uh man i was really like damn this guy actually cares about the craft of songwriting what's up with that you know oh. it really reminded me of when i was doing that myself which i, I kind of lost that that bug but you you have it still or at least when you made the album and uh like you took us on a journey and you made sure that every step of it you're going to give us something to look forward to you know and then a reward and uh you weren't rushing no 15 seconds you know right right. you know you you had you had a format that was familiar but not always like not always super familiar you know yeah that's that's a big compliment thanks man thank you uh, Oh, you're welcome. I, I meant, I mean, and I, like I said, I shared it with my friend who uh, was my co- my co-producer. Yeah. Because I think he's going to appreciate that. Mm-hmm. Like my first album was really filled with, 2001 came out, filled with songs uh, that were really complex and rich. And that, that's what I, like, when I heard your stuff, I'm like, oh, wow. Songwriters are still alive and thriving. That's what I felt like, you know, your oh. Jim Croce's and James Taylor's. Yeah. It was like that, yeah. you know, that class. So. Yeah, well, that's, that's a, like I said, big compliment. But I also think that's, that's, that's the payoff of when I'm performing with people. If I can see they get my joke, if they, or if I could see they, they, they understood that song, um, as abstract as it might be, um, I get a sense that, that I took them on that emotional journey and then at the resolve, it's a sort of sense of, oh, we shared something and it was more than 15 seconds and, and, and it's fulfilling because of that. If not, and then, and then of course, it, 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 if, let's say it's not fulfilling, but then it can still be entertaining. You know, it's, it still can be, it, sometimes it doesn't have to be so deep and, mm-hmm. and, and, and uh, so, yeah, no, that's a big compliment. I'm, I'm blushing. What can I say? <laughs> 
Yeah, no, but really, I was like, oh, good. You know, I was yeah. just relieved, you know, to hear, <laughs> to hear that. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, so our friend Joao mentions that I do knock on Heaven's Door. <laughs> yeah. If you find it, you, you could do, look up John Henry Sheridan, knocking on Heaven's Door, but that, that'll be, I actually have, uh, I did that cover. But yeah. uh, if you look up Batendo, not Porto do Seo, you can see that video on Facebook or YouTube. I'll put in the show links. Thank you, Joan, yeah. for the shout out. No, I'm, I am gonna, okay. I'm gonna check that one out. But that's a great example. One of those songs that I think people are approach. They can approach it because they know it. Um, it's a very, you know, it's it's a it's a pretty shareable, deep concept. You know, considering the afterlife and mm -hmm. and uh, and then. Um, and then the music itself is, 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 it's simple in its construction, but you know, in its execution, very difficult. And so it took, it took some real, uh, I'm, I mean, I'm, uh, kudos to you for doing it. So. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. I, I, for a long time, I, I would lead jam sessions. So my, my thing after my first album came out, I would do gigs mm -hmm. and I was alone and I was playing to bars and I was like, this is kind of lonely. So how am I going to make it more fun? Yeah. Uh, so I started inviting people. Say, if you come down, it's like John Henry Sheridan and the Acoustic Collective. And I was at a music school, so I would tend to get some people, and yeah. they would just hop on. So my my sets became simpler and simpler because I had to have songs that people could quickly learn. So yeah. Knock on Heaven's Door was a standard. It was like four chords, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then I, I incorporated incorporated other ones that were simple. And um, but it's one of these ones that probably played more than almost any other song and uh i don't know why it works every time it's one of those kind of like bohemian rhapsody uh people for di very different for different reasons but people just they hear it and they get it even if they never heard it before it's like they they know it it's weird yeah, yeah. One of those songs. No, that's cool no I'll, I'll have some i'll have a so so the question i was going to kind of get to and and uh, uh was um the idea of uh how many covers and how many um originals do you tend to share when you play out live and stuff? Hmm. So when I was doing that series of uh, Facebook lives in 2020, mm -hmm. I, I did 10 weeks or whatever it was. Uh, I, I, my ratio was um, one to three. I think one, uh, three, one okay. cover for three originals. For three originals. Okay. So in a, in this 12 song set, I would do four covers. Yeah. Um, prior, previously in my years of playing, uh, I would end up doing many more, mostly covers and a handful of originals, mm -hmm. but it just got me so sick. I'm like, God, come on, why, yeah. why, you know, that, that, that's like when I was saying like uh, selling my soul type of feeling. Sure. Because sure. those covers are not but the covers closest to my heart. They're the ones that I knew worked, you know? Yeah. Um, if I play a cover that is close to my heart, it's almost like an original at that point, you know? Like when you do fake plastic trees, it might feel that way. Too. Right, because because that's not one that's going to get everyone on the dance floor. But you know that that's the there's one where a good portion of people would be like, "Oh, I love this song." Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And people might even think it's yours if if it's not mm -hmm. a popular song that you're covering. You know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like so, I well, part of me I do like right now I'm releasing my heavy metal acoustic songs. So cool. I did covers of uh, a, a a bunch of heavy metal songs all together maybe. 18 or something but yeah so i'm releasing uh i'm gonna do release a few iron maiden songs and uh black sabbath song soon okay um i already have a few of them up there just they're just me acoustic guitar and voice maybe yeah. like a hand drum mm -hmm. and it, very much the campfire mentality i was thinking like i want a folk song that sings about this topic uh but i don't want to write it because I know it already exists because this heavy metal band sings about it. So let me just make an acoustic version. So that's what I did. It's been yeah. almost two decades long project now, but I love that idea. I think I was, I, I wanted to start like a, a metal band, but we would all be acoustic instruments. Um, mm -hmm. It's sort of a, a, sort of a comedy comedy show would be you, all these, all these metal heads mm -hmm. come out, but they all do it all acoustic. <laughs> so. Um, but um, I definitely uh, like the idea of uh, of you take that expectation of a metal band and then putting it into an, ac an acoustic um, and seeing how things change and seeing how what what parts of it maybe uh, get accented because because it's acoustic you know the lyrics are a little bit more important and the lyrics are a bit more profound or something. 
Exactly. That, that, that was kind of the vision. Like that's cool. Uh, uh, Peggy Seeger, um, Pete Seeger's sister, visited Brooklyn College where I was, and okay. I went to her master class. And she was talking that, you know, folk music needs, folk music is such a powerful medium. It's the music of the people. This is like 2004 yeah. or something. I went to this class, and you know, but there are a lot. There's so many uh, topics, social issues that are important that have no songs. You could write about abortion. You could write about racism all these yeah. things like she said what who hasn't Social written about issues, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and what hasn't and at that time she was just kind of sharing her point of view and i'm thinking wait there are, there is songs about uh i don't know climate change there is songs about um uh, various social issues that i could think of uh child abuse that mm -hmm. that are in heavy metal but uh people a whole vast group of people are not going to know it because no. it's heavy metal Right. So I thought maybe I could take those because I was having fun playing around with that. But then I took it a level deeper yeah. and make it these songs that could be sung around a campfire. And in 2000 years, if heavy metal is not in vogue, but playing guitar and singing still is, those <laughs> songs could live on, Yeah, you know, yeah. with a little a little help. Yeah. Well, and you can do it all on an, on acoustic guitar. You don't need a PA system. You don't need a mm -hmm. good. So you can. Yeah. Yeah. So it was this like alchemizing process. I took mm -hmm. the song, I, you know, it took, you know, because I'm a guitar teacher and a composer. So mm -hmm. I would say, what is the essence right here? And I would kind of, and what's not only the essence, but what's playable. Mm -hmm. And then I would simplify it and sing the melody in a way that's pretty similar. And I don't know, I'll, I'll put a, a video to Eagle Fly Free. Um, it's a Halloween song in okay. the show notes, which you can find later if you, if you want to yeah, check it yeah, out. Yeah, I know. I'll be checking them out. Yeah. Mm, cool. Um, so I'm curious, uh, unless you had a question that we didn't get to, uh, no, go ahead. Can you tell us how you got involved with the uh, sign language? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, uh, this last year, um, is when the signing really, yeah. Um, the signing really started. So I have a really close friend, Cindy, who's the uh, young woman that signs, signs with me. She signs with me. Her name's mm -hmm. Cindy. Um, and uh, we were just friends for just a long time, years and years ago, we've been friends. And um, it wasn't until just now, just kind of after the whole COVID-19, when um, we had time uh, to kind of work on something and, and we go on bike rides. And, uh, and uh, in this conversation that I kept having with her, I would be learning sign language and then she would, uh, uh, kind of expose well i guess it give me a, a she opened a door to understanding the world when you can't hear it and uh um i i got my ears tested i i think every, i think everybody's gonna lose their hearing eventually you know we're in such a loud world um so um uh, since then i was sort of like oh that's cool that's really cool um she's also been really helpful with um uh just helping me as an artist and then one time I was like, well, why don't you come up and sign one of my songs with me? And she was like, awesome. Um, so we started, we started this uh, deeper conversation of signing, signing poetry. Like, uh, for example, uh, in the English language or most languages, you have this idea of rhyming where you have two words that have this similar sound. But um, how do you rhyme in sign language? Like, what, how do you com how do you explain rhyming to somebody that has no sound to reference and has no sound to understand if it's similar? But you know, she 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 reads. She reads the lips very well. She's very smart um, and and uh, uh, incredibly generous. So after uh, all this time, she started to learn each of my songs, and we started having this conversation of like, well, what does that mean? Um, the uh, uh, you know, what's, what's the story behind that song? And uh, it just became more and more interesting to, um, I, I, you know, wanting to share this idea of how to say, like, we'll do the cover Royals. And so we'll have a, by, by Lordy, Royal by Lord, Lordy. Mm -hmm. And so we'll have a little section in the show where it's like, well, this is how you sign Royals. And this is the King, because I'm using the letter K. That's so when she would sing royals and we wanted the audience to echo that, we'd like try and get the audience to do royals in return. And, and um, so it, it has a real educational aspect to it because um, 
I think people uh, get excited when they see sign. I think like being a uh, we done it at an old folks home and everyone just really enjoyed it. Suddenly I'm getting comments of like, I didn't hear a thing, but I was watching you guys and it looked awesome. So, um, uh, it, it's, a, it's, just, it's, it's a whole different, um, angle that I, I hadn't ever really thought of until now. And now, and now that I'm doing it, it's, it's becoming more and more fascinating to explore concepts like metaphor, um, because metaphors are all cult cultural, um, and so any of that deeper meaning, any sort of poetry that I'm trying to convey through music, um, maybe I can't achieve that. But I think she has. I think she's found a visualization of the sentiment of the song. Um, I'm trying to give you, uh, I'm trying to think of uh, a, a kind of an example, but uh, not at the top of my head. Um, I invite anyone who's interested in more of that sign language to check out my website because we're developing these YouTube videos. And a lot of those videos are all about um, signing um, certain expressions or certain words. Um, and, uh, and then also exploring like, why did she say it that way? But that's uh, something that applies in any language. So you must, you speak Portugal pretty, Portu Portuguese pretty well, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like I'm sure there's this disconnect of like, well, we would say this in English and that would be funny to an Englishman, but if you were to translate it to a Portuguese person, they oh, it, yeah. it wouldn't it wouldn't make any sense to them. It would be mm -hmm. it, um, so understanding that and then also trying to bridge the gap has been pretty fascinating. So um, we uh, we've got a, a list of shows at some festivals coming up, and and it's a big part. It's a big addition to what uh, my music is right now because. Um, there's a bigger culture of hearing impaired and deaf individuals that, um, that still enjoy music. That was the other thing. Uh, she tells me stories. She tells me stories about like the music concert she's been to, um, and trying to work with an interpreter. And, uh, I'm sure people haven't really thought of that concept, um, until, you know, the news broadcasts have an interpreter helping with them. But I suddenly realized that these interpreters are going in blind. They have no idea what the band is going to do. They have no idea what the song is saying, right, right. especially with a band like Tool, when it like the words themselves, I don't think they want people to know. So <laughs> how do you how do you expect that to be translated? But uh, um, she she still wants to be a part of that cultural event. She still wants to be involved in that show because of either she can still feel that um, certainly the visual side of shows becomes much more interesting, which makes me go, Oh, well, I need to make my, I need to be more visually interesting. I used to be so embarrassed talking with my hands all the time. And then suddenly I realized that's what she liked about me. That's what she, she found approachable was me using my hands. Um, and uh, so uh, yeah, my, my vocabulary is getting better. I'm getting better at sign language, um, but it's still, it's still in the process. And uh, uh, so that's that's kind of where it's it is it feels really quite new to me, but I'm excited to uh, see um, where it's going to take us. What what areas of of uh, the country might be really be interested in sign language and music and exploring that whole subject? That I um, I know uh, I've seen other signing artists online and they're fascinating. Um, and it, I'm 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 I. Uh, but they're usually they're usually signing a cover, so the idea of sort of having a conversation with the songwriter, uh, with the story behind the song, mm -hmm. and then and then understanding what actually translate literally and what doesn't translate so well, um, mm -hmm. it's been it's been a lot of fun. Yeah. Wow, it sounds yeah you're uh, breaking boundaries, man, with your comedy and your uh, sign signing. Yeah, and and your, your mixed I, album of like you know certain genres and the, the other genre. I, I don't yeah. like to fit in the box. I like to. Yeah, I can I see like, that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's cool, man. I, yeah, I, I saw that on your website. I didn't have a chance to check it out. Now mm -hmm. I will, especially since I learned more about it. And yeah. Yeah, no, there, there's a blog there. That's, that. There's mm -hmm. a blog on uh, beer and sh uh, vegans. And, and in the articles, you'll find little keywords and learn how to say something specifically in sign language. Mm -hmm. You can do it elsewhere, of course. But we're, we're trying to develop this, this interactive show. Um, um, even though I can still hear like masks, because, because of this, um, at my jobs, I still use sign language as a visual cue, as a social cue to say, you know, here's, I'm trying to get your attention or I'm trying to help. And, 
and it's been pretty helpful. And I could see it being a you know, something that any, 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 anybody could really benefit from having some basic knowledge of sign language. Yeah, wow, I could, I can imagine. So, is your friend who's now working with you musically mm -hmm. is she hard of hearing or can't hear at all? If um, that's okay to say, I don't know. she's she's eighty percent deaf, and 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 I think hard of hearing is another way of saying it. Um, yeah. And and I never quite know which one's um, Appro uh, appropriate. Mm -hmm. She's. Um, uh, uh, yeah, but I guess she gets she tells me that the idea of, of sound when she's living her life, it's 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 like, you know, um, she can only hear a little bit out of one ear and the rest of the time it's body vibrations and visual cues. Um, so I'm terrified to play poker with her because she could probably like read my bluff from a mile away because she's <laughs> so tuned in on um, on all those subtle cues that um, she had to kind of learn. And uh, so when you say deaf or hard of hearing people listen to music, is it like that they don't, not 100% deaf or that they, they could still just enjoy the vibration if they put their hand against a speaker or something like that? Yeah, yeah. And there's, there's a whole varying degrees. Um, right, and right. I, of course, I don't know about all of them, but um, there's uh, the, 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 the individuals that can, I mean, we, we all still feel that vibration. Um, she she can definitely relate to something that's more dancey because of that low kick beats, mm -hmm. um, um, and but at the same time she'll she'll uh, hear things that um, that uh, has its own quality and has its own effect on her and sort of her state, and um, and mm -hmm. she'll enjoy them just the same. Um, uh, I think, um, but beyond that, I think people who when we say are you know deaf or hard of hearing or enjoying music, there is still that lyrical quality. There is still that poetry of something, and uh, that sound healing is still or the sounds are still being made and they're still affecting the body. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's sort of like um, just because these don't work doesn't mean they aren't still experiencing it. Um, and and I think that's maybe where my eyes were opened a little bit wider, because there's. Um, uh, yeah, especially when you get into words and the stories of songs, sometimes that's even more interesting than the actual song itself. Um, mm -hmm. There's just a, it's just a whole different way of looking at something that I've been looking at head on for 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 years, and now I have somebody from the side telling, kind of showing me how to look how I'm how it looks from the side, and it's 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 really really mm -hmm. inspiring. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. I never would have thought about it. Uh, I mean, all, my extent of it is pretty much. Um, what I know is uh, Beethoven, the wonderful mm -hmm. composer, started losing his hearing in his 30s. By the age of 40 or so, he was completely deaf or legally deaf. So he sawed off the, the legs of his piano, was on the floor. So he would just put his ear there. And if he's touching, he would be able to differentiate if it's yeah. harmonious or not. But his music did get a lot less um, harmonious as he got older, whether it's his mind or his hearing. It became a lot more experimental and hard for people to listen to. Yeah, uh, I wonder if that that dissonance is what he was enjoying, like right, because there it's more visceral, maybe visceral. Right? Yeah, yeah. There's more the the, the discord could 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 speak. Uh, that's an interesting point, though. I I, I um I uh, I'm gonna have to pay a little more attention to his older stuff. Yeah, check it out. It's some people are not a fan of it, and I mean, you know, it's it's certainly not Ode to Joy. Although I think he did write Ode to Joy when he was deaf and that was probably his last hurrah mm -hmm. then he got into the more experimental stuff that, that's when he peaked <clears throat> pretty much yeah mm -hmm. um yeah uh any other topics that we didn't get to that you want no, to touch I, on? no i mean i there i feel like you and i could talk for hours but i, I know yeah. it's getting kind of late over there and and uh, i really just enjoyed already we should probably wrap it up on a high note and then uh maybe maybe visit like this again or visit in person in the future mm -hmm. so, yeah, yeah, we could always do a part two uh, if mm. if uh, before next year. Hopefully, we'll cool. see each other next year. Yeah, yeah. But uh, we could do. Or we could also just hang out on Zoom one day, you and I, yeah. without without a in the public eye. If that's yep. possible too. They'll just be um, jealous. Yeah, it's all. We'll just tell them the stories, the highlights. It's like um, so cool. So yeah, thank you everybody for watching. Uh, thank you so much, Ben, for uh, being on the show. And uh, yeah, so guys, go check out benbrinton.com. I'll put the, the show notes there and uh, listen to the music, check out the signing, uh, also the comedy. And uh, Sin MC says, great chat. 
All right, cool. Yeah, right. that's that's Cindy. Yeah, that's Cindy. Yes, thank you, Cindy, for for being with us. All right, Ben. All right. Much love, brother. Love you guys. See you. Be well. And uh, I'll uh, send you the links to the show. For your Looking reference. forward to it. All right, take care, brother. Thanks, Johnny.